Welcome to Rocketship, the home of epic React Native content. I'm Simon Graham, creator of Galaxy's Dev, and today's guest is Mark Lawler, the creator of NativeWind. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned you at least 10 times in all the episodes, and you're finally here, so thanks for joining me, Mark. Hey, mate. Yeah, it's good to be here. Happy to talk about NativeWind and everything else. Exactly. So uh, maybe, you know, uh, if you're listening to this, that Mark's the creator of Native Wind, maybe not. Uh, we will get a lot into Native Wind during this discussion. But uh, Mark was really awesome when he did like the, the initial show notes. He, he basically gave me like a full article on styling in React Native and, and what we should fix. So we're going to actually start at the beginning and then uh, continually work to um, basically conclude in why Native Wind exists. But before we get into all of that, um, just want to mention, you are currently working at Expo, if I'm correct. So what is your current job? I always like to ask the people at Expo what they're doing because nobody can give me a real answer. So what are you doing <laughs> at Expo? Uh, yep. So I work on Expo. I'm on Evan Bacon's team and I'm currently working on the Expo router project and kind of also anything that helps improve the developer experience at Expo, mostly focusing on like the web aspect there. Uh, so like a good example of this would be the typed routes for Expo mm -hmm. router. They're like a great feature that kind of like ties together that feature. Uh, Expo router just makes it like a really nice development experience. It definitely does. Yeah, I, I love pretty much everything about Expo Router. So thank you. I talked to Evan before, so but thank you to you as well for yep. uh, building pretty awesome piece there. Um, just just f uh, to get this right in the beginning, I think you created Native Wind, then you joined Expo, and now I'm I'm not sure is Native Wind kind of like is Expo working on Native Wind or is this Mark Lawler working on Native Wind? Just so we get that right in the beginning. Yeah, so there was a little bit of confusion because um, there was a period of time when I said that I'll be moving something into Expo. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't actually native wind. It was actually more CSS compatibility within Metro. And we kind of like reined back the scope of that project, but a lot of that project actually did end up inside your Expo config. Uh, so if you use Expo router now, you can actually import a CSS file and they'll get bundled up as your static X, um, assets. And all that work kind of came out of that project, actually getting that CSS pipeline into Metro, which n never really had that before. Uh, okay, good to know. Yeah. So yes, it's kind of like a, a styling system, but yeah, more of a bundling aspect of it. Mm. And, but you still continue working on, on uh, native wind right now, like next yep. to your work. Yeah, that's right. So Expo is like really good. Uh, Native Wind is under my own personal brand, but Expo is very supportive of the work that we're doing there. Right. I mean, Expo is supportive of a lot of other uh, open source <laughs> projects as well. So um, it's just almost naturally that they support a good uh, solution here as well. So as I teased, you gave pretty good show notes to me that almost outlined the, the whole topic for this discussion. But I want to start with the basic. The, um, I want to start on let's fix styles. I think that was actually like your last conclusion, <laughs> uh, how this evolves into like an epic piece of touching five different technologies. So uh, let's fix styles. What is the problem with the style sheet API in React Native? I'm going to start really with the basic. Well, the style sheet API is more just a primitive API. It's kind of saying like, here's the most basic things that you can do for the most basic styles. So if you just want to make something red or you want to set the color or the border, it gives you those APIs, but then it doesn't go anything further than that. If you want to have any sort of like complex styles, like styles that change based upon a state, it's up to you to implement them yourself. The Starsheet API doesn't go that one extra step for you. So you can kind of think of it as, yeah, just your styling primitives. And that's about it. But um, based on the like on the recent state of React Native Survey, it still looks like many people are actually fine with the style sheet API, right? Yeah, and like there's nothing wrong with the style sheet API. Um, but styling itself it can get quite complex. Uh, so styling is inherently a state problem, like a state management problem. So like what are what is the appearance of an object depends on different states and where it is. Like is it hovered? Is it pressed? Is it focused? You have dark mode, 
media queries, all of these things. And as your app get, grows and you start having to incorporate more of these states in, Starler can get more complex. And that's when you start to reach for a, uh, a styling library over the actual style sheet API. Right, yeah, you, you also mentioned that um, so with React Native, we see this currently, the, the latest thing has been like React Native on Vision Pro, but of course React Native on desktop and all the other platforms becomes more possible right now. And uh, I assume that the, the style sheet API is just not covering those cases anymore correctly, like the web is actually doing. Yeah, so styling on the web has changed a lot in the last five years, since like React Native first started. And we've, it's evolved a lot of new concepts, like people are familiar with media queries, but we're starting to see also like new units that people are using, like viewport units, container queries are a new thing that's being introduced. And these concepts kind of haven't found their way back to React Native yet, which is really interesting because like you said, React Native is part of this multi-platform vision. If you've read the blog post, um, It talks about how they want React Native to be the best development platform for everything. And mm. we see that with Microsoft um, bringing out React Native Windows, React Native OS X, and we've got the Vision Pro now. We're kind of moving away. Like before, the devices we were working on were, you know, phone size. <laughs> and now we've got to see React Native on your 72-inch television. It could be on massive billboards. It could be on your Apple Watch. It could be in virtual reality on an infinite canvas. And so when we work with these sort of like different types of applications, we kind of have to ask ourselves, is the Stylesheet API good enough to handle all these new scenarios that we're just about to throw at it? Hmm. I, I still remember the time when like the first iPhones came out and, and I was so happy that there's like just one size and even like the, the like the first two, three generations, it kind of was the same dimension. And at some point, like it became longer or shorter or wider. And uh, at, at that point, I got really mad about Apple because previously it was really easy to do styling and then it suddenly all messed up. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of like web developers also remember a time when we used to make separate web pages for the web compared to the desktop. Mm -hmm. There was a period when we used to go to m.facebook.com to, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> to see the mobile version of Facebook. Like this whole concept of having something that works on different devices just didn't exist back then. Okay, so, um, I mean, on the web, everything is cool. Uh, how can we just, like, bring this from, from the web to React Native now? Like, like I just want to have my CSS. That, I mean, in, in a perfect world, I would think that we just write the same CSS we do on the web and just use it for React Native somehow. Well, ideally, that would be perfect. Um, but the concepts don't quite translate across one-to-one. -one. So we kind of have to find a happy middle ground where people can bring across the same uh, patterns and concepts, but maybe not translate it one-to-one -one just because the systems don't perfectly match. Uh, so I guess like we can start at the beginning, you know, React Native is Flexbox based. Uh, the web has Flexbox. That's good. It gets us quite far, but you know, where do we go past Flexbox? Because Flexbox has its limits. And so if you look at what the web has done, they've introduced things like container queries where you can style uh, something based upon like its parent size, its parent shape. So if you move something onto a larger screen, it's like, oh, my parent's bigger. I can change its appearance, move it onto a smaller screen. It's shrunk in size. It needs to you know, drop icons or things like that. And it's those sort of patterns that we should be bringing across into React Native to have these more adaptable apps that can work across these devices. Yeah, I've also been, I mean, for media or container queries, I've always, I think I haven't used container queries myself a lot, but you also mentioned like CSS variables and I've been a big fan of CSS variables or environment and it's just not possible yet. Yeah, so that's the other part of these patterns is that people have worked out that the best way to do things like theming is to use CSS variables, like actually use the, the system that's built into the platform. And we see a lot of libraries now taking advantage of that. And there's been a lot of work in the web um, to create these great styling libraries that people love, but kind of just work seamlessly. And they just take advantage of the inbuilt style system that's there. And CSS variables are kind of like 
the best primitive for the web because they can be used for all sorts of use cases. It's not just theming. Uh, they can be used for different sizes, dimensions, even like partial colors. And it's quite amazing what the web has actually managed to do with having this powerful primitive in their styling system. Right. So you, you mentioned a library called React Native CSS Interop. What is this library and what can it do for us? Yeah, so this is kind of the backbone library behind Native Wind. It kind of powers it. It takes the concept of if you were going to build a style sheet, create a like a style sheet create API now, what would it look like? Like what concepts would you bring in? How would you design it? And no matter how you approach it, you end up with something that's kind of CSS like. Uh, you would have like rules conditions, your properties, your CSS variables, and you basically just end up at CSS because it's a really well-defined spec. People are very familiar with it. And so how would you then represent it? How do you write your config file for your CSS-like language? Well, you would write it inside CSS. And so that's why CSS files are like the backbone of everything. Every styling library compiles to CSS. So the idea of this library is if everything compiles to CSS, why can't we take a CSS file and compile that to React Native styles? And so it can read a style sheet and split it up into actual static files along with metadata about those styles. So this is like the conditional information, like show this style when the width is bigger than 500 or show this style when it's dark mode is active. So in the other half of this library is the actual runtime that compiles, takes that information. So we compiles that all that information offline. It's just like a CLI tool that takes in a style sheet and spits out the data. And then there's a runtime that can wrap React Native's components and say, okay, I understand both this metadata and these styles, and we can start polyfilling parts of the web into React Native, adding in concepts like CSS uh, variables and the media queries and the different units. Hmm. So it's kind of this framework agnostic library to build, <laughs> to build a styling library on top of. So, so this was like the first thing you actually did before then coming up with native wind, I guess. Oh no, this actually came a lot later. Oh. Uh, ah, okay. So a native wind uh, was originally started off basically how people think what they think of it is let's just take a CSS <laughs> string and turn it into objects and put it into a React Native component. And it was pretty naive in how it worked. And that's basically what native wind version 2, the current version that's out there. But the problem with that approach is you make the syntax easier. You know, people like Tailwind, people like writing the styles, but you're not actually really solving problems that people have with styling right now. Uh, you're basically just changing the syntax and saying, cool, call it a day. That's all I've done. So this new library, it's actually uh, with Tail uh, NativeWind version four. It's kind of why it's taken so long for us to develop there because we actually like went back to scratch and said, how can we really solve the problems with styling that people have? How can we build an engine that's powerful to bring in new, these new concepts? And when we have these new concepts, then people can combine them together to actually solve real world problems. And I know I've been saying like CSS variables, media queries, all these things, but these things are just the primitives in the system that you can then use to build out these applications. So uh, maybe I'll give a, a better practical example here. Um, in React Native, it's kind of difficult to style a child component based upon its parent state easily. So mm -hmm. let, let's just um, imagine you have a pressable and inside of it, it's got an icon and some text, like a button. If you want to, when you press on that pressable, you want to change the color of the icon and text you then have to write an event handler that calls a use set state hook to save the state to then pass the back to those child components. And then you can adjust how it is. 
you've built your own mini style system there. In React Native, there's no way to say, hey, link these components together, best it, the state from this one should affect these. The React Native CSS interop knows about CSS concepts. It knows things like inheritance to say, you could put a class name on the parent and a class name on the child. And the rules of the child say, when the parent is active or when it's hovered, the child will actually do that styles for you. So we can, it, <laughs> sorry, you can just put these class names and we will like link these up, the complex styles through all these primitives behind the scenes. So it sounds complex and it kind of is, but it is, it allows you to basically what you'd be to people do on the web every single day, which is put a class name on something, put a class name on something else and they get styled, they get linked together. I mean that's that's a pretty powerful concept, and uh, are we I'm just checking out React Native CSS interop on on npm. So could I use <laughs> like it? It just links to the Native Wind repository, but I can also install this like without Native Wind and use it myself. Or would it be any yeah, helpful so like like, if I create a new styling library? Probably. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is to eventually open source this with proper documentation, so that if you are building a component library in React Native and you want to have these functions, you can use it. It has its own starsheet.create API that's very mm -hmm. similar to, uh, kind of actually similar to, to the Stylex API to be able to create these powerful styles. And Native Wind actually just compiles down into these, this library. Uh, on Twitter, I've posted examples of getting like Panda CSS working in React Native or Stylex getting it working in React Native. And that's because these are web libraries that actually just produce a CSS file. And because we can interpret a CSS file into React Native styles, they can just work. And that's the real powerful thing about this library is it's kind of, when I say it's like framework agnostic, it's CSS framework agnostic. As long as your CSS library produces a CSS file, which they all do, then we can then translate that and get it working inside React Native. Okay, so that is the foundation, I would say, for like future styling of React Native apps. And it, I mean, it sounds great. Um, now we just have to like get down into using it. So <laughs> I think that's that's the point where where Tailwind CSS is probably coming uh, yeah. onto the stage because of its popularity. Or well, there's a couple of points there. I'll get to it, but um, yeah. So the problem with actually writing CSS for React Native is, well, we don't support everything. Not everything translates across. And so right, like people might be listening and freaking out, being like, he wants us to write CSS for React Native. It's, it's not quite that because CSS is, it's a little bit of a mess of what you can <laughs> do in it. People love it for the basics, hate it for the advanced stuff. And so we, I agree, like it just, it's not always the best fit. But what we can do is we can find CSS frameworks that align with the ideals of React Native. And we can just support these frameworks so that they translate across. That way there's not much of a mental shift. You don't really have to be like, can this work? Can this not? As long as you work within the boundaries of these supported CSS frameworks, we can get this to work. And Tailwind CSS surprisingly really fits well within the mindset of React Native which sounds really weird at first, but I can kind of explain it. Please. <laughs> so the first thing is, if, to your listeners, any notion you have of Tailwind CSS, just <laughs> drop it. Like all the arguments on Twitter, people saying the pros and cons. The reason is because like they're saying that within the context of the web. And in the web, Tailwind is controversial and probably my, my, my favorite argument that people say is it doesn't add value to the web. It's simply a wrapper around CSS or inline styles. And you could just write CSS. Like, why are you yeah. writing Tailwind? You could just write normal CSS. And so I like to say that it's a, a horizontal shift. It's kind of making something look pretty or ugly, depending on if you like the syntax. But it's not really adding that much value to <laughs> the web. In the context of React Native, it's a little bit different. One of the biggest well, things people say about Tailwind is it's 
just improved inline styles. You know, why would you do it? Just write CSS. Why would you write improved inline styles? But in React Native, we don't have the CSS engine. We only have inline styles. So if these are just inline styles, shouldn't we investigate this a little bit more to work out why these are better inline styles? And so the reason why they are like better inline styles is because they convey more information than the standard styles do. You have things like modifiers to change how the style behaves and to set up these different rules. You have special keywords that say do special behaviors for different things that we can tap into. And you essentially are writing inline styles, but just as a string instead of, instead of an object. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we all know the, the super long tailwind strings <laughs> yes. from the web and, and the picture is like, why are we using tailwind in the first place? But the, the value add here, and it is actually a value add for React Native, is that we can convey more information than what was previously possible in the styles. So while tailwind on the web is a horizontal shift, being like, hey, you could use this, but instead you've chosen not to, on React Native, it's a value add because we can actually add something to the styling system that didn't exist before. And when you start seeing it that way, in the context of React Native and just forget about the web arguments, it becomes a really more enticing. Um, uh, again, if you see some tweets on Twitter, people have been posting about animations in Native mm -hmm. Wind V4. And they're doing these before and after pictures where you have like before here's all my reanimated code where I had to import in reanimated. I had to declare these variables. I had to set up the event handlers to kind of link them all together. And then when I come to native wind, I just have to add two strings onto my class and it's the equivalent. And this is in referring to like the transition classes that say when a style changes on a component, transition between the before and after. And so before you would have to write all that boilerplate yourself. It's a big big chunk of like 50 lines of code, but native can just see that class that's on the components and it knows what, you, what your intentions are. It can actually set up all that boilerplate for you. And that's the, the biggest value add that it brings to React Native. Yeah, I've I've seen the the demos on X um, or Twitter or whatever. Um, it it looked amazing, like it almost looked magical because it's just like a line or something with Tailwind, and it and it just works. And is it is it like we're getting? I mean, we're getting a bit ahead of us because we're not getting to native wind. But is it really like using reanimated also under the hood? Does it have the same performance like we have with the fifty lines we usually set up? Yep, it's just reanimated under the hood. All it's doing is just doing that boilerplate for you under the hood so you don't have to do it. You, you're a magician. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Okay, so um, that's a pretty good point. Like, okay, yeah, Tailwind on the web is controversial. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I mean, I don't see the point of arguing too much about it. Like, use it or don't use it. We don't have to make it a religion and fight over it. It's like, yeah, it's as you said, it's an addition on top. But I see your point that it's actually enabling React Native developers to do more things. So under the assumption that Tailwind CSS is the thing that we want to use with React Native and with the previous knowledge of React Native CSS interop and uh, everything we've talked about so far, Native Wind is basically the answer to styling React Native for multiple platforms, right? Yeah, well, that's the idea. It's, it, I wouldn't say it's the answer. It will be a answer to be able to do it. Right. But it's an answer that allows you other sort of concepts as well. So one of the biggest advantages of taking a web framework into React Native is you bring along the web community with you. So like there are one and a half million React Native downloads every month on or every week on NPM. There are six million downloads of Tailwind CSS. It is just the Tailwind CSS community itself is four times bigger than the entire React Native community in terms of size. So in terms of then educational content, blogs, tutorials, 
explanations, videos, how to do things, even just finding components online, there's this huge community that's just sitting there that you can tap into. Because the best thing about having your styles as class names is what I call copy paste ability. Right? <laughs> the ability to just simply double click on a string and say copy paste and paste it into your React Native code and it just works. You don't have to import any libraries. You don't have to then be like, oh, okay, how do I translate this into reanimated? Like this cool animation, do I have to jump on YouTube and watch can it be done in React Native <laughs> to even learn how animations work? Like right. you don't have to do that knowledge. It's just, I see a cool keyframe animation, copy paste it, it will just work there for you. And so it allows you to then move to faster in your development because you can no longer have to worry about oh, how do I do this with styling? You can just be like, cool, let's copy, paste, move on with the business logic that I actually care about. So I don't know if it's the answer, but it is a great answer just based upon the resources that it's suddenly become available for you in solving these new concepts that we're not quite familiar with. Um, maybe a good example of this is XO Router at the moment we are uh, with added web support and we're trying to work out how do we adapt the navigators that were built for your small phone onto the web screen. You know, we're looking at patterns in the web users and they're like, okay, let's bring these into these navigators to style them better, to make them easier for people to use. And so if we had a styling system just there like this, we could just already take styles, find like good things on the web and bring them across. We wouldn't have to like reinvent the wheel again to actually do this styling. Yeah, I mean, if we can somehow tr like transform regular React developers into React Native users or um, not transform them, but enable them to build React Native apps, I think that's like an unbelievable boost to React Native and um, to the skills of all web developers, because I, I, I think in the future, every web developer should also be capable of building a native application um, simply because it's actually not that hard. I mean, yes, there are like some parts about native apps and Apple's and Google's review process, but that's a different story in, in general. Everyone should be, a, uh, be able to do this with React and React Native. And um, I agree, it would be epic to just like copy Tailwind examples. I'm a big fan of um, Tailwind UI, like these pre-made UI components. and I've used them countless times and just dropped them in my web project and applied some bit of different colors here and there and, and boom, everything was ready. And um, yeah, if, if this could at some point or if it will work and become more popular with, with native and uh, React Native, that would be like uh, an unbelievable improvement, I guess. So um, before we get further into native wind, and I know we're already like 20, 30 minutes into this, um, just like from from the outside, native wind. Um, a quick description of what native wind is. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, native wind as a project. Uh, maybe <laughs> we'll actually Ooh. explain the. Um, there's many different explanations for this. Actually, <laughs> go, go uh, a few years back. <laughs> go a few years back. I um, don't know when did it start. Actually, it started about. Two years ago, actually. Ah, um, not too many years back. Not too many years back. And the idea was simply how can we make React Native compile easier um, for the web? Like how can we take a React Native concepts, bring them into the web so that you can do static rendering and things like that. Uh, but I realized fairly quickly that a lot of people were trying to do that, that there was a lot of projects like you've... Um, Nate from Tamagui is a, mm -hmm. probably the best example of a project that's being like, let's take React Native concepts and bring them down to the web. And I thought, well, why are we bringing things down to the web? Why don't we enhance React Native with that body of knowledge that the web has? Let's bring the web a little bit into React Native, not fully, but like let's bring those patterns and concepts across. And so that led me on the journey of how do we take a style sheet convert it into styles um, and looking over these libraries and working out which one suited React Native the best, which one added the most value, which one saved us on the boilerplate, which one had patterns that solved the problems that React Native has. And that's how I landed on Tailwind. 
And just as a coincidence, Tailwind blew up at the kind of the same time. And I was like, okay, I made right. the right choice. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's still kind of early days for Tailwind as well. Yeah, it's been around for seven years, I think, now. But really, in the last like four or so years, it's kind of really kind of exploded in popularity. Um, yeah. Okay. And so this is when when, when so they yeah, just start. yeah, just like when you're on that journey and you learn what you can do, because it's kind of interesting because it kind of opens the doors. Because not many people have kind of taken this exploration journey before, of what does this enable, right? Um, you had Theo on before. He was talking about Flutter developers and how mm -hmm. sometimes they have like blinders on about what is possible with their framework. I think everyone has blinders about like what their current framework is, including React Native, and we're kind of we believe our styling system is the best but we've never really seen the grass is greener on the other side. So this became a project of, okay, cool, what can I show React Native developers now? What does the web have to offer that we can bring in? And that's kind of where Native Wind exploded in popularity, where people started to see these patterns that they've used in other projects and said, oh, now I can do this in React Native. It just makes my easy. I don't have to reinvent the wheel again. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks so easy. And I think the setup of native wind, especially compared to something like Tamagui, is actually pretty straightforward, right? Um, it's it's a simple installation and installing Tailwind, and then you could use Tailwind in your project. Yeah, it, we hook into the actual, the Metro bundler um, to actually try and set up all your compiler. This is one of the advantages now of actually being at Expo is that I actually work on the bundler, especially for Expo router. So native win v4, I work on both sides. I can work on the bundler and fix the bundling features and also work in native wins to make sure it works the best with the bundler. I'm not saying it's tied to Expo, like native wind, it doesn't, you can use whatever you want with it, but I can kind of, make sure that the expert users have a definite like first class experience with it. Yeah, nice. D during the day you get paid to fix the bundler and at night you can <laughs> make yes. native wind even better. <laughs> or even better, I, I can work out the problems and then go nag Evan to try and help me fix them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, I do have a question. Um, native wind, I think, is currently at version two, as far as I know. Yes. The next version is four. That is my first question. So where did we leave the three? <laughs> but also, yes. uh, but also, uh, I think Native Wind has been at version two for a long time. And when I go to Native Wind, there's like Native Wind before is coming soon. I'm pretty sure I've seen this last Christmas, definitely, or even before <laughs> that banner. So uh, yeah, where did we lost version three, and <laughs> where is version four? Yeah. So. Like I said a bit earlier that version two was a bit naive in its approach. It basically took a string and converted that to objects and it didn't really solve these problems. Version three was an, a rewrite of version two that made things a nice bit easier, a bit cleaner, but it never actually, it never solved these same problems. It still had the same inherent problems that version two had. Uh, it, where it basically wrapped components. You couldn't use other Tailwind um, management libraries and it didn't really play well with the rest of the ecosystem. And so version three was eventually abandoned just because it just wasn't the right direction for the library. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people had already jumped onto version three because they uh, develop in the open. It's all open source on GitHub and people love jumping in early onto early yeah. access projects and people had already published stuff into production using version three. So I couldn't just change how it worked. But for version four, it's been a long research and development process to actually land where we are. Uh, the I thought I knew what the best way to approach it. And so I published it online. I said, it's coming soon. Everyone jump on and everyone jumped in and gave me a good code review. And <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of people say this, this works, but this won't scale or this can be done better if you do this, or you should stick to react principles and 
not hack React to get this working. And so version four actually went through multiple re-architectures and different feedback from different people. And I think we're finally at a place now where nearly most people are happy with how the code is laid out and how it works under the hood with React. Like how the, the magic happens is essentially what we're talking about here. And we're at the moment just kind of running through the last of the testing processes, making sure that everyone has a smooth onboarding experience, that deploying and bundling all work fine. And we're edging closer and closer to the actual release. So, so we're getting closer to the release. Uh, yes, we I think are. it's, it's yes. going to be happen in the, in the first half of this year. <laughs> I think it's going to happen in the first half. Yes, I'm actually hoping. Fingers crossed. Within the next uh, probably a couple of weeks or so. Oh, so, so solved... maybe when the episode is live is yes, maybe actually, it's a coincidence probably... that Native Wind V4 is right now uh, <laughs> the, available. Oh, nice. Probably actually, yeah. Okay, so. Um... Yeah, I think we've covered how we got to native wind, why why tailwind for React Native is good, and uh, what native wind is basically. Um, I I have to admit I haven't worked a whole lot with native wind yet. I tried out Tamagoi and and stuff um, to see like how things work, but could you describe like a few of the coolest things of native wind? I mean, from the outside to me, it's like I can use tailwind with React Native. Period. That's that's basically yeah. the what I think of if I hear native wind. But I think it's it's like a lot more, and you have a lot more insight into what's really cool about it. So, what does native wind enable us to do within React Native? Then, well, we'll start there. The cool part, obviously, is you can use Tailwind in React Native. So, if you're already familiar with the syntax, if you've already got that knowledge, that muscle memory, the editor tools. It just kind of works and you can just hit the ground running. Once you kind of get past that, there's a lot of things that you might notice that like, will sneakily work in native wind that you're like, actually, wait, how does that work? A good example of this is if you put a style on a view, let's just say a, like a background color, and then you say, let's put an active background color on it. So active is the keyword for pressed that view will now change color when it's being pressed, which seems kind of fine until you realize, wait, isn't that what a pressable is for? How can a view change a color? That should be a pressable. And that's because Native Wind is actually smart enough to know what your intentions are with the styles and it will render the correct object for or the correct component for you instead. It's like you've been passed a style that has a a pressable class on it, so therefore I should have render a pressable instead of a view for you. And there's a really sneaky inversion of control here because styles can be passed through components. So you can have a parent component that has these the class name strings and it passes it to a child, like maybe it goes through like three or four components and eventually reaches a view. The author of this, of this view could be like a third party component but suddenly you can change that third party component to be oppressible and have these actual styling. And it's these sneaky little adjustments that we can do all sorts of things with it. So that's the most basic transformation that we can do. The next transformation is, I guess, the transition classes where you can say, uh, you should be able to transition from one value to another value. And you can just put this on any component. You can put it on a text. And then you're like, wait, doesn't this have to be an animated text? Why does this just work on the text component? And that's because under the hood, we're like, oh, well, this is an animated style. Therefore, we'll swap out your text with it being an animated text. And there's actually a really great talk by uh, Fernando at last year's AppJS that kind of talks about this concept. The talk is called React Native in 2030 of the things that he would like to see. And he would like to see us only have like one view instead of having the seven or eight that we have. He'd like to see animations and transitions just being merged into the styles. Being able to be like, here's this animation, I'm gonna pass it through my props down to whoever wants to receive it. And NativeWind works that way. So you can pass these classes down through props. You can manipulate the classes. You can add, they're just strings. So you can actually, add onto a string, filter out words from the string, 
merge them together, splice them, do whatever you want. It's not until they actually hit a component that we're like, okay, let's convert this. Let's actually pull out the metadata and change it to what you want it to be. So, okay, I got, I, got, I got questions about this. So for, yeah. first is, um, you, you said a few times, animated or reanimated. Um, I know for Tamagui, there's like the concept of adapters. So you could decide which animation library you want to use. Does native wind use reanimated by default or how does like the styling, the transition part work? Uh, we use reanimated by default um, just because it's, what I feel like is the best animation library. It's a bit of an opinionated view on, on it. We don't allow people to change it out at the moment, but we're actually looking at having a plugin architecture in the future that would allow you to swap out for different animation libraries. We don't really necessarily want to tie people to one. It's just uh, this is kind of how it is at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fair choice. And uh, also you said like you can just use transitions and the stuff. Can I use 100% of the things I can use with Tailwind CSS or is there a limitation? Like, are there things that are not supported that I can usually do with Tailwind on the web? There are things that are not supported, but these are things that people probably wouldn't be trying to use in React Native because they're just not in React Native at all as well. So these would be like using, uh, what's a good example? Um, some of the styles that don't exist. Uh, so people trying to use like grid, uh, you know, with React Native is Flexbox only, uh, although it looks like we're getting display block pretty soon, which looks pretty good. Uh, so those styles, they just don't work. But the way Native Wind works, it works just like CSS. So if you give it an invalid style, it just drops the style and moves on. It's able to mm -hmm. go past it there. Okay, that's good. So um, is there any other specialty uh, of native wind that's worth pointing out at this point? There is a lot. I have barely even touched <laughs> the surface. <laughs> so Go ahead. They're kind of like what I was saying, like what people would discover fairly quickly is like special things that you can do that styles just seem to change components. They can be passed around. The patterns that you used before of style manipulation just work now. But it goes a little bit further because... The advantage of Tailwind is to be able to chain modifiers together to say like, here's a basic style. I wanted to apply these conditions on top of it. And suddenly you can do that in React Native very easily. Like just saying that something is active is good, but you can also do this is dark mode active or this is dark mode active in this media query for this screen size. And you can create these very complex styles that would require a fair bit of like state management and they just mm -hmm. naturally work for you as well. Yeah, I just quickly browsed around the theme page and I noticed that I can also have like platform themes like iOS or Android yep. themes. So they're, they're just another type of modifier where you can say this style should only be for iOS or this should be for Android. Um, but we also take this a little bit further as well because we actually extend uh, Tailwind a little bit more for React Native. So we allow you to do things like um, platform select or hairline width or pixel ratio. And these sort of like React Native styling concepts are also available within these Tailwind classes as well. So it's not just the platform select. It's the whole like pixel ratio API or platform color to be able to use the actual Android or iOS colors that are in the system as well. Ah, nice. And you also see, yeah, container queries. Uh, there's a plugin for it available. Yep, so that's part of the uh, Tailwind CSS. It's not officially part of Tailwind CSS, it's just available as a plugin. The other thing that we haven't got the documentation up just yet are CSS variables. I kind of mentioned mm -hmm. this before, but CSS variables are kind of like the backbone of theming on the web. But mm -hmm. they can store information about colors, but they can store information about other things as well. So a good example is you might have a theme color, which is a HSL value. You know, HSL, you got the three variables there. Each of those could be a custom property or a CSS variable. So you could, you could have a CSS variable for H. CSS variable for S, CSS variable for L, and being able to change those individually as you move down. So 
you will see component libraries where they offer things like themes where you can give them like a selection of colors and then they might have like theme inversion or things like that. Well, this actually gives you fine grained control to actually create, do whatever you want. So maybe you want to have a theme that can be hue shifted. And so you just supply it with the custom hue value and then suddenly everything will hue shift to that color. Or maybe you just want to change the saturation. So you can just individually, individually change that saturation value. And we can even go even further with that because you can do mathematical calculations just like in CSS. <laughs> so you can do, let's take a custom value and add 10%. Uh, so or like the calc function on the web. Yep, the calc function. You can do the max, you can do the min. You can do clamp and you can actually create these really advanced custom styles and themes for whatever your brand and your application is that you're not locked into whatever the component framework offers you it's up to you to decide how theming and styles work inside your application and this is where everything kind of really clicks together and you realize that native wind isn't a component library. Like we're not saying this is how you use our system. It's a set of primitives and it says, go nuts, go build your own. Here's the Lego to build whatever you want to build. Yeah, I, I really like this. I'm, I was just checking out the variable section with CSS variables. I, I definitely like this. Um, I come from, from Ionic and they have like a whole file of CSS variables that you can just override to like make the components look like yours. And I always kind of like that approach as it, I don't know why it felt quite easy to just, yeah, just override or replace these series as variables. Um, it just looks a bit like in your example, you're passing it to a view style and then I have the vars function in there. It looks a bit complicated. I would kind of have to like more in sort of a configurational way included, but I don't know, maybe that's just possible with somehow rewriting the code as well. Well, you can actually do both. So you can declare these inside your Tailwind config file or inside your CSS file, depending on how you want to write ah. it. Or you can manipulate them at runtime by passing them into the style object of a view. So CSS variables are inherited down. So when you mm -hmm. pass it into a view, anything inside that render tree under that view gets access to that variable. So this allows you to say, okay, um, maybe you want to do sub-theming. Like this is the main theme of our application, but then when a modal pops up, it has like a slightly different theme to it. Or you can say, okay, now let's just change the theme inside this modal just by passing it different CSS variables. You don't have to use like a theme context or you know, these things. You just hook into the, the actual styling system that's there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I had another question. So you, there's a whole category layout inside the native wind documentation. And I know that reanimated has like layout transitions or layout animations if something changes. Is there a connection between these two as you're using reanimated and you kind of support uh, layout stuff? I, I just checked out something that was actually web only, but um, does native wind somehow support these transitions of layout because I, I mean they're kind of basically like, like shifting the layout of your page yeah we don't uh if, if you talk about the actual like layout transitions so like when you navigate from a page to page a component will transition to like a new area there we don't support yeah, or those. if you just remove yeah. an element from a list there like also the layout function is called then on the on the parent component yeah. uh so we don't support those yet but you can build them yourself uh, in the same way that the web doesn't have these layout transitions, but you can still build them into the web. Uh, so we just give you those primitives. We don't go that one level higher where these you have these components that can kind of do that. But, but like those, um, just to like sound that, like we give you like the transition. So we would say you can mark this element as it's been destroyed, play the animation for what it mm. would be, and then remove it from the DOM or remove it from the render tree. We give you each of those primitives so you choose how that wants to, how you want it to do. Because maybe you want it to like fly off or do a whatever custom animation, like yeah, know, it's up bounce to you. it out or whatever, yeah. so curl it up. Yeah, I think um, on that topic, I, I'm not sure, but I think it was in one of the last podcast episodes. Um, where I think we are talked to Casper 
it's not at this point it's not yet realized uh, released i think they're working on something like native exit layout animations in reanimated so you can like define something natively how your view transforms when you close it so you don't have any like only swipe to go back so if you're interested in in that custom stuff uh, everyone check that out okay so um Regarding native wind, you um, said something interesting. You said that it's not a component library. It's, I mean, just like Tailwind CSS is not a component library, but for Tailwind, we do have ShedCN, which is quite popular on the web. And just this morning, I saw that there's native CN UI. Have you seen this before? It's currently at like about 500 stars on, on GitHub. Do you think this is uh, like the way to go? Is this the way as the Mandalorian would say? <laughs> Well, I think the best thing about component libraries is there should be many of them because you should be able to pick the right tool for the job at the time. And so depending on what you're building, it, the, you choose the component that best suits the application that you're looking for. So there are component libraries that say, look, we do everything for you. We bundle everything. And if you just like want to do something very quickly, no customization, they're good ones to choose for. Then you've got these other new types of component libraries, which are kind of like headless, where they don't really provide the styling. They just build themselves around a styling framework. And they say, look, we'll give you the logic for the components, but it's up to you to work out the styling. We just give you access to it. And they can be really good if you're building an app that has very, like, you've got to have a certain appearance or certain branding. You just don't want to use off-the-shelf components because they're just not going to fit into the appearance that you want. And these new sort of libraries are really powerful for that, for that sort of extra customization. Is, is, uh, I, mean, I don't know if you're familiar with native CNUI. Is it built on top of uh, native win? I know it, like, it says native win support, but... Uh, I, I believe it I is know. built on top of native wind. Um, okay. but there's which is, which other... is interesting because it's still so early days for native yeah. wind and there's already another library built on top of it. <laughs> uh, this is the, what I was saying about building in public. When you build in public <laughs> and people are like, you know what, this solves my use case already. I don't care if it's gone, I'm going to start using it. And like, that's like, if it works for you, use it. I've been saying like native wind wouldn't be where it was if it wasn't for the early adopters giving the feedback, letting me know how it works, how it feels. And I think everyone is just kind of building these tools so when it is released, they're, they're actually there, ready to go with it as well. There's some other like component libraries uh, that are taking like really interesting approaches as well. Uh, because Native Wind is just a styling library, it's not a component. There are components like uh, GlueStack mm -hmm. that have their components and have their styles they're able to just drop their styling library and say, you can use native wind instead with their components. So there's actually like a glue stack native wind as well, where you can use a native wind styling engine instead of their existing one. This is kind of similar to like what you were saying with Tamagui previously, where it allows you to choose the animation driver. This is like choosing the styling driver for your component library. <laughs> oh, crazy. Yeah. I haven't thought about that yet before. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I mean, it's it's going to be interesting to see what people come up with once like native wind becomes even more popular when the V four releases out, and uh, if we're going to see more component libraries like these. Um, but I want to talk a bit more uh, before we wrap up about the future of native wind. Um, so probably first, uh, I think you said in the beginning already that native wind and Expo are not like combined, and there are no plans to combine this, right? Yeah, so there's no plans to kind of combine it. Uh, we just want to make like Expo Router, we want to kind of keep a little bit agnostic so you can choose whatever tool you want. It will work and be the best platform. It's not tied to anything. You don't have to use this, but we want to make sure that it has the, uh, the bundle of capabilities to support whatever you have. But with the new things that we're seeing coming to React Native, so... Expo Router now supports static bundling for web. So if you want to actually have like an app clip, which needs like a website that you can go to, or if you actually just want to have a website for your React Native application, you can actually deploy your app really simply online and have a, the website version of it. On top of that, we have 
React um, server components are a new thing that's kind of coming. Mm -hmm. We're exploring how they work inside React Native. We, we've got to keep agnostic to these new sort of styling libraries that can support these new concepts. Like how do you transfer a component across the wire in a JSON format that can work with all of these as well? So uh, Expo is not like tied to one thing. It's kind of keeping it open for all these new concepts because not everyone will use server components. Not everyone will build websites. People, there's going to be your traditional iOS only developers or Android only. We want to make sure all of those still work. We're not trying to force anyone to use anything. But as these new concepts get introduced, we want to make sure that it also works with these newer libraries that are coming out. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, and I think Evan on the pod also shared some, some things about the future. Uh, if anyone is interested, go check that episode out. Um, especially about Expo Router version 4 and, and what's happening after, like a little rename and rebranding. Um, and he also teased something like writing, I don't think, I don't know if he said this directly on the pod or afterwards, like about a, a general language, so like making it a lot easier and you're cooking something up that's like giving you web and native stuff. And I'm going to be surprised how easy it's going to be. So I just wonder, because with Expo Router and Expo Web, I currently can, I can use CSS, um, and is there like a conflict of interest between native wind and what's going on and what's supported with Expo Web and, and Expo Router or um, like is how are they connected basically? Yeah, but, well, I see native wind, like I said, it's a value add on top of things as well. So there's no sort of conflict there. Uh, Expo is just trying to provide uh, the CSS support is really just can CSS files exist within the, the pipeline of a React Native application. So like Metro never had the ability to just import a CSS file. It, do, it didn't know what a CSS file was. It only knew like these are JavaScript, these are assets. What's this extra third thing on the side? <laughs> um, so the, the first trick was to actually get that working. And now we can support like the web platforms in these like CSS uh, type uh, styling libraries. So there's no real like conflict there. Um, The best thing about like I think native wind is that it's also encouraging like different styling libraries to pop up as well. Like a lot of other people are kind of taking this approach of like, okay, well, what if my React Native library also had a CSS style sheet? Uh, so like Tamagui is really good for this because they compile all their styles into a style sheet. Now Expo can pick up that style sheet that they produce and bundle up your application and push it out. And so it we want to make sure that that still works. For everyone and there's no like hey you have to use this what we do want to do and i think evan talked about this a little bit is we want to standardize things a little bit better between the, the platforms and we're seeing this with react native itself there's a big rfc about standardization with web apis and react native and actually on the day of recording of this react native strict dom was made open source Uh, which is uh, Facebook's new uh, library that's compatible between the web and React Native so that you can use a div on either of the platforms and it has a similar API between it. Ooh. And so we also want to follow that standardization. So that's why the Expo Router with the um, API Routes API, uh, we made sure it was standardized to use the web winter cg apis uh, so that you can easily communicate and we just want to make sure that we keep that standardization going across everything so not just api routes like if you want to use styling web apis but they're also kind of available and it just breaks down makes things a little bit easier to learn for new people but they don't have to learn how does the web work how does react native work they can just see what the standard api is and let and they'll just work everywhere Uh, it, it's funny because just minutes before this recording, I, I found an article which was pretty new in which I saw that there's a package called Expo HTML elements from which you can import things like H1, P, B. I, I don't know how I missed this. Is this also something new? <laughs> uh, this is quite old. Um, this was Expo's attempt from a couple of years ago to actually like make a standardized API mm. uh, that was kind of more like React Native first, but allowed you to actually render out the um, the HTML elements. 
the React Native, oh, so the React Dom, um, strict DOM is the more, I guess, like this is the Facebook endorsed way of doing this. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this is not the way how it's going to to end no. up. No. <laughs> okay. Um, Expert HTML elements will probably just wrap, be a wrapper for this library in the future. Yeah. Okay, good. Good to know. Okay, so I, I have something I want to ask you in the end, but before that, let's conclude by giving me your plans for native wind in the future. So as we said, native wind v4 is probably already released when this goes live, if we're lucky. Um, but what are like the future plans? Is there anything else like big on your roadmap that you want to tackle after the v4 release? Well, after the thing we, I really want to solve are patterns that people use, how to make styling concepts easier in React Native. So there's still a couple of primitives that I want to introduce into native wind that makes these patterns simpler. Uh, so I talked a little bit earlier about how child components can be styled based upon their parent state. So that's like a parent state selector. I want to also do the inverse so that a parent could be styled based upon maybe some mm. of its child states. Uh, so this would be, let's just say you have a checkbox and it's, oh, it's a form element, right? So you have a view that has a label and a checkbox. And when the checkbox is ticked, you want to put like a nice green border around everything. Like, how do you do that? You'd have to add in the event handlers to then say, okay, when checked, apply this border to everything. It'd be a lot easier to say on the outside view, when my child is checked, be green. When my child is invalid, be red. And just actually have that as part of the styles. And because then, again, you can pass these styles in. So that's like one thing I want to do. Uh, I want to also make the animations a little bit more advanced. So one thing you can do with, so at the moment we support keyframe animations. So you can go to like animate.css and get the most craziest CSS animation you want, copy and paste it, and we'll convert that into a reanimated keyframe animation. One cool thing you can do with CSS animations is actually change the transition timing between each keyframe. Uh, so we want to bring that in because you can create much smoother animations and mm -hmm. just get that like, you know, there's like that little feel of animations. Like when something just goes like, you're like, ah, but when it does like that nice little funny smooth, yeah. like just the easing values, it just feels that little bit better. Um, we want to support spring animations. So the web oh, has nice. uh, the new linear easing, which allows it to do spring-based animations. So we want to add that in. And just basically keep polyfilling things that people would find useful. Uh, so bring in more of these like CSS functions that allow you to do the more dynamic styling. So there's a, there's a lot there in terms of just native wind. Um, I can just keep talking. I've got many plans. But the other <laughs> thing I want to do is like go all the way back to our conversation an hour ago about saying how the core library that powers all of this reads from a CSS file and enables all of this to happen. So all that NativeWind does is it uses Tailwind CLI to generate CSS that can be picked up by this that makes all this magic happen. There's no reason why Tailwind has to be the only library that we support. We can actually grab other libraries that maybe people like the syntax for them a little bit more. Maybe people like Panda CSS. And we can actually bring that to React Native. You know, if, if you want all of this functionality, if you like what we're talking about in these concepts, but maybe the tail and strings are what you don't like, or you just, you know, that you just want something a different syntax. That's all that's all you care about. Just give me something different. Well, we can do that because that's why I split this into these two libraries. So I can just be like, okay, throw away the tailwind library, replace it with something else. Cool, we have a new thing. And then the last point is I want to make some better APIs. So if you are looking to build a component library and you don't want to have to build a styling system or a theming system for it, you can just actually pull this in and we'll just give it to you all out of the box with nice APIs ready to go. And you can just hit the ground running building your custom components. That, that's a lot on your list. Uh, it's a huge future. list. <laughs> And people are like, where's Native Wind V4? I'm like, eh, it's a big backlog. <laughs> but yeah, that, 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 that sounds so amazing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to everything that's, that's coming in the future. Um, there is one sentence you sent me. I think that was in the 
probably in the in the long article I, w I should really publish this because this is like maybe i'm gonna just if you're fine with it i'm gonna raw dump it below the podcast as the notes yep. um so sure. people can follow your 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 thought process on this but you had a pretty interesting line that i would love to uh, expand on so i quote you I don't see native wind or expo router as necessarily solving people's current needs. It's more what I think are their projected needs in the years to come. So I always love to fantasize about the future and uh, what the future holds. So, so could you explain what you meant with this sentence? Well, a lot of people are looking after, say, a app application for well, an app that they've been using for the last five years or so. And so maybe it was just a iPhone app. It's just for iPhones and you haven't really gone into Android yet, or you maybe you're an iPhone and Android. And you haven't really expanded past that. But as your company grows, you're going to start wanting to think, oh, well, maybe we want a desktop application. Maybe we want to move into VR. Maybe these other platforms are bigger or Maybe Apple suddenly says, hey, everyone needs to have a website for the app because we want app clip. Maybe app clips are like the new thing that everyone has to have. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. How do I, how do I now build deep linking into my application? And like, that's the main thing that Expert Router really solves for native, like how to do deep linking into any screen into your application. And so maybe you don't need that just now, But it's good that that's when you do need it because that's kind of a direction we're heading into. These libraries are there for it. And so if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, man, I don't really need media queries in React Native. I don't need CSS. We're not doing theming. We're not, we're not doing animations. Maybe you're not doing that now. But over years, like the barrier to design, it's got to keep increasing. Like the quality of things will slowly keep going up in time. And what people are expecting of a, like a baseline application, like your really basic styles maybe won't cut it in the years to come. And we've seen this on the web, like compare websites from the 90s where <laughs> like what was the design for them now? So like what is expected of the websites? And these are full-blown multiple designers coming with the most pixel crazy designs and micro animations on everything. Like that sort of attitude it's probably going to creep into native apps as well. And so do we have the tools available for us, resources to actually build these sort of apps that people are demanding? So that's kind of what I mean by that statement. If you already want to do that, it's good we're building it for you now. But if you're not you're like, oh, this doesn't apply to me, well, you know, things change. And <laughs> maybe like that, that bar is going to creep up to you and you're going to have to look at these other tools. Yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm still kind of sad that the guest book stuff doesn't exist anymore. I think I don't know why we let go of that. That was really a nice, nice and friendly way. But I completely agree. The standard of apps has increased a lot over the last years. Um, just like basic apps, I, I did this in app review episodes on YouTube as well. It's like you, you can't have a shitty app anymore and expect like thousands of people to to rave about it and come to it. It's just not working in in 2024 anymore. People are so used to a certain level of quality as they are also on the web. And yeah, this bar is just going to increase over the upcoming years. I'm, I'm pretty sure as well. Yeah. And also like your tooling will increase and change what people can do. Um, so one thing that the web is playing with now is like AI generated layouts. So to be able to go to an AI and prompt it and say, I want a layout mm -hmm. that looks like this and it spits out the code for it. Now, Those tools aren't really available for React Native just yet because we use a bespoke styling system. No one's really trained these models. But like, if you can take, if like you can take the CSS from those and copy and paste it across <laughs> into like, people could be saying, well, why don't we just use these tools? Like, there could be like weird demands on you as well. Well, my favorite is like Figma has export as Tailwind styles. I love this because then I can just actually export directly from Figma into my React Native applications and just get all that styling coming across. And I don't have to like do the, the manual translations. And so like these sort of workflows and like how we learn about edge and education between stuff, they will might even change like how we view styling inside React Native. Like is stylesheet.create, you know, is it worth it if it takes you half an hour to convert a Figma <laughs> design into styles when someone can else can just go, yep, export, copy, paste, off I go. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And that takes us back to the beginning. As we said, 6 million downloads for Tailwind and 1.5 uh, million for React Native. So if we can enable all these uh, Tailwind developers to come join us. By the way, if you're a Tailwind developer, check out galaxies.dev where you can easily learn <laughs> React Native uh, and, and get started. And I think that also wraps up our conversation. I think we've um, explored really well of like starting on let's fix styles and how we arrived on, on native wind and what's possible or what's important in the years to come. So thank you so much, Mark, for, for coming onto this pod. I know we went a bit over time, um, but I think it was worth to, to hear the thoughts of the creator of this tool directly. Yeah, no, it's been fun. Um, hopefully I haven't gone off on too many tangents. I could talk about this for a couple more hours. <laughs> I could go yeah, forever. I mean, maybe we're going to bring you back and talk more about like the ins and outs. And also, I, I, at one point, I wanted to ask how all of this works under the hood in, in Native Wind, like this whole transition to reanimate it. But I think we would have probably gotten too technical there. So maybe we're going to save that up for, for a future discussion. So for now, where can people find out uh, more about you? What are the links that they should check out? Uh, really, the best is either my Twitter, uh, which is just Mark underscore underscore Lola with the two underscores there, uh, or my GitHub, which is just Mark Lola, no underscores. And of course, also nativewind.dev. I will uh, yes. put all of and these my links. Website, uh, in the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will, I will put this. Yeah, you can forget it. We haven't yeah. talked about native wind today. It's, <laughs> it's not as important. <laughs> anyway, got to drop this in the show notes. If you also want to learn uh, React Native in the first place, check out galaxies.dev, as I said, where I have tons of pro courses. And I'm pretty sure I should do pretty soon a course on using native wind because I do have a course on Tamagui. And with all that we've talked about today and with native wind before probably being released at this time, uh, I guess it's a good good addition to the archive. So thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time. And I will catch you again in the future. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you around. Bye. See ya.